Oh, I sure hope he's here because I love precepts. Like I, I feel so. Oh, yeah, I think you. I think y'all will. You guys will get along real well. I um, I feel so because most of them are Calvinists, and so I feel so secure when I'm around them. All right. Hey, Johnny. I'm sorry. I, I, can you hear me now? What's up, Super Mario? Hey, buddy. Thanks a lot. This is a this is a more polite forum than than last weekend's uh, forum. Uh, by the way, Doug, I'm Aaron. Pleasure to meet you. And I've heard you engage with um, with other Christians already, and you seem like a complete gentleman. So it's it's really my honor and pleasure to to speak with you. Well, thank you. He's nicer than Tanner, and I thought Tanner was a real sweet guy after talking to those guys last week. John, so, do I? Yeah, no, totally. <laughs> do I win a, an award or something? Do I get a ten dollar gift card to Applebee's? You're, you're right there of my favorite atheist award already. No doubt about that. <laughs> uh, and so now as I consider myself a truth seeker, and I hope you can under, understand where I'm coming from, when I hear this, I say, is this method of how they came to this conclusion? God pulled me out of this DUI situation. God, I was addicted to drugs. I, I had the... My, all my electric shut off. I was desperate. God and God came through in the end. And same with the Muslim guy. When I hear these stories, and yet this is, and I think, and I appreciate you telling yours, because I think this is the true reason why you believe what you believe. I'm not denying that. But when I hear these stories, I question how can we say that this is, how can we be confident that this is true? that the source of what's behind it all is true when the conclusions are so vastly different. I think that's, are, are you, I didn't want to interrupt you. No, I, I'm done. Go ahead. Uh, well, th yeah, thanks for sharing that uh, with me. And, and I understand that. And to be honest with you as well, that's was a question that I had. I mean, so, so I'm, my dad's an engineer. I'm kind of a, mathematical guy i like being able to say two plus two is four and we know it i like so i like to be able to understand things and, and that kind of deductive thinking um so i started doing internal critiques and that's one thing greg bonson was was great at teaching me so we start saying okay if christianity is not true then what is true so i i can't when, when you mentioned before you talked about an eternal earth you talked about maybe the earth's always existed or maybe it existed from another so then we we get to the idea is is there is it possible that there's a infinite amount of past experiences. Well, I don't know. That that can't that doesn't make any sense to me to think there'd be an infinite amount, an endless amount of past experiences. So, okay, so let's just think of theistically, let's think that something caused it. There's something eternal that caused something that's um, not eternal, uh, the earth. So I, I started doing uh, Ravi Zacharias was actually the first one I started studying. And he, we were, so we were doing a study. Hey, Aaron, on, can I uh, can I stop you right here? Because I wanna I wanna just um show something that there's a there's a saying that says that beliefs come first reasons come later and so when what we're talking about what we were talking about is how we actually got into the belief in the first place uh, me included when I was a Christian and and then when you become a believer in a God belief and then you start asking the question in retrospect okay yeah, I see this Muslim guy, he had a similar life as I did, and he came up with it. So then you start coming up with reasons why your belief is actually true. And I just want to illustrate that point that I think that's what actually happens, is we come up with reasons to justify our belief. I, I understand why, why you'd say that, and that's not an absurd thing to say, but I think it's also reasonable. Uh, do you know Dr. James White? <laughs> yeah, um, I do. <laughs> the reason why I'm laughing is because I did a critique on him too, and um, yeah, don't you know, don't go to my YouTube channel and watch it because then you'll not like me. No, no, I gotta tell you, you you really are fun to talk to, Johnny. Johnny's been meaner to me than you've been. I mean, I'm being serious. Johnny's been busting my balls here uh, over the last few years. You're you're much more polite than him. Uh, <laughs> but uh, no, what what I was gonna say was so so for me what what what. Um, what, what James White, you know, in, in Durban, they'll do a lot of stuff with the Mormons and the um, uh, Muslims. You know, Bonson did a lot of critique on Hindus and, you know, pantheism as a whole. 
And I, I got no, I've got notes all over this house, and I've got stuff typed up, and I've got video saved, and I've got DVDs and CDs everywhere. Um, I can't find a coherent view of origin, meaning, morality, destiny that explains how I got here, why I'm here, why I feel a need and a consciousness to behave a certain way, and why I feel an aspect about myself that's not just material meaning that, that I'll still be alive when my body dies. Um, so, so when I do critiques on, say, Muslims, for instance, we were talking about Muslims earlier, to me, that's not that hard of a... And Muslims and Mormons, I, I mean, and I, I've got some great friends that are Mormons, and I have some friends that are Muslims too, but to me, it's not that hard to, to do an internal critique on, into these coherencies of the thoughts when you, when you look at right. Muslims who say... The Old New Testament is a spoken word of God, cannot be false, but this think, is the new word of God. But then they say Christ didn't die on the cross. Let me, um, let me jump in here for a second and ask a very simple question. Why do you think the Muslim... Do you mind, do you mind acknowledging what I just said real quick, though? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, um, I understand you that... You said a problem compared to... You said you had a list of problems for the Quran and a list of problems for the Bible. To me, that's a problem I can't get past on the, uh, on the Quran. Yeah, I, I want to repeat back to you just very, very, very briefly So, uh, to, as evidence that I am listening to you. You were saying that you have, you're, you're doing an internal critique of all the different God beliefs, all the, the religious systems out there, and it seems to you that Christianity is the only one that's coherent, that the only one that makes sense, the only one that explains things like origins, intellig intelligibility, uh, morality, and so forth. And when you look at religions like Islam and other and Hinduism, which is even stranger, um, you're not seeing that coherency like you're seeing in Christianity. Am I understanding you correctly? That's uh, correct, sir. Okay, so and but here's my problem. My problem is that when I talk to a Muslim and I bring up these incoherencies, they don't see it. They just can't see it. Now, why do you think that is, Aaron? Well, so what does the Bible say? Why do you think the Muslim why? cannot see the, inc the inconsistency within their own worldview? Well, I'm wondering if I want to take this into a further, um, almost end up conclusion portion of the conversation or if I want to kind of bait this around a little bit. Why do I believe that a Muslim or say even a Mormon doesn't see it the way I see it? I don't believe that it's been revealed to them appropriately. I believe they've been deceived and that they've decided to choose it for whatever reasons that uh, they suppress the truth of, the, of what they want for whatever else they want. I mean, just like I suppressed the truth because I wanted sex, drugs, and alcohol. Uh, I wanted... I mean, I mean, I hate to be vulgar and I hate to talk. I wanted naked girls around me. I wanted to, you know, have being drunk and, and having a fun time. And, and that, that was a big priority in my life. Now, say for somebody like my friend who's a Mormon, who's been raised a Mormon, if he if he denounced Mormonism, I don't know that his dad would even be his father anymore. I don't think his father would speak to him anymore. M Muslims are famous for that. When you look in, in these cult-like religions where if they denounce it, their families essentially are... are outcasted from from them as a person that they care about and love you'll notice in christianity and some christians i think i think some people have felt like that within christianity but i know for instance if i became an atheist tomorrow my my mother and father would still love me the exact same way they pray for me probably more and they would they'd probably be more encouraging to me to, to to try to encourage me to get back to my relationship with christ but in no way would it make them love me any less but i think you you, you do see in I, when I was talking with Johnny. I did some some internal critiques or or studying on Scientology recently, which is not tough to to critique. But I want to I mean, say you know, I, I want to say that I, I agree with you. I agree that the Muslim cannot see the inconsistencies in their belief system, uh, and I listed some of some of the things you said because they have a lot at stake. They got lots to lose. They're in a culture that believes this religion. They would become an outcast. Their family might disown them. Uh, you mentioned that they might be deceived, that they think that what what they believe is consistent and, and coherent and true, but they might either be deceived by the devil or by themselves or, or whatever. 
But now let's reverse it and reflect those reasons on yourself. There could be a God out there, and you may be deceived in thinking that Christianity is, is coherent, when really maybe it isn't. Or maybe the part of the reason why you cannot see the inconsistencies within Christianity is because you as well have lots to lose. With I, 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 honestly, I have almost I have nothing to lose. I mean, I, I, if, if I genuinely felt that um, that this just wasn't true, then my dad would still watch football with me. I'd still call him and say, "F Tony Romo" because he threw an interception, and he'd laugh with me just the same as. You know, we laugh now. And I, I don't know. Johnny knows I'm not afraid to use a curse word. I don't think it's a blasphemous towards God. I don't use God, God's name in vain. But, uh, you know, I, I, it, my, family love, my family's love never changed for me when I ran from God or when I was seeking God. I just think it's improved because um, I've learned how to love them better. But their love for me never changed. But do you see what I'm saying, like the broader point that people within a, a religious belief, a belief system, are the last ones to see the inconsistencies within it. Oh, I mean, I can understand where you're coming from with that. I don't know that that's specifically appropriate to me, but I mean, I, I, I get the concept. So how could we, let's say Christianity is completely consistent and coherent, but yet we're suspecting that maybe there's something going on within us that maybe we're deceiving ourselves or that because of our inherent biases and the culture we were raised in, how would one kind of mitigate all those things to actually figure out whether it's consistent, truly consistent or not? How could, what would you recommend? Well, I would look at, I would, I would certainly recommend starting with reading the, I would start with John, of course, you know, it starts with John in the beginning, there was the word with the word that was God and with God was the word. And so it, it kind of gives an account for the, be, the beginning of human life into no, no, Christ. No, Aaron, I mean, Aaron I'm, I, going, I'm going farther back than that. I'm saying like, okay, we're, we're now, we're truth seekers. So now we're not assuming the Bible's true anymore. We're, we're, we're open to the idea that it's true, but we're also op open to the idea that maybe some of it's true and some of it's false. We're truth seekers. So we don't assume that it's true. Completely. Would you... Have you read the book of Isaiah? Yes. Would you say there's got to be you know, some, some, some coincidences or some similarities between the things that are talked about in the book of Isaiah to compare to okay, what the Bible is? Okay, that's a great about? point. You're bringing up prophecy, right? So uh, yeah. let, let's say you and I were on a mission to figure out whether Christianity is really true or not. And so we open up the book of Isaiah chapter 53 and let's say we also open up the book to Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. And we say, wow, look at this. Here we have hundreds and hundreds of years prior to the event, the prediction of the exact date of Jesus' coming and the piercing of his hands and feet and the casting of lots. And that he'd be ugly. And all these things. And I used to believe this, these prophecies as well. But as I was saying earlier, I started asking the question, well, how do Jews view these verses? Like, it's, it's so clear to me. Why isn't it clear to them? And not only that, why isn't it clear to my fellow Christians who disagree that the 70th week in the 70 weeks prophecy is the, the post-Jesus' arrival? They fight aggressively on this stuff why, why if this is supposed to be a clear prophecy that we can look at and say yes this is true why is it that so many people even within their own belief system disagree about it that is interesting i don't know if you ever listened to bonson versus rc sproul where they're arguing evidential apologetics versus presuppositional and, and obviously you know uh post-millennialism which jeff durbin and Sy get into and calvinism versus you know, other different uh, views of that. So I, I, to be honest with you, as a Christian, it disappoints me to see uh, Christians get upset uh, to the degree where they're almost shaming the, the belief system in itself by the way they're treating each other. That's something that I, I, I regret. And it's, it, it's, it reminds me also of the, I mean, I can't tell you how many people I've met that have said, you know, I just don't like Christians because 
I know a guy that went to church on Sunday and he thought he was a better guy than me. And he cheated on his wife. And because he's a, you know, I just, so I don't believe Christianity because that guy was an asshole and he thought he was better than me. So when you talk about people arguing over, over that particular aspect of the Bible with the prophecy of Isaiah, it is unfortunate. I think that, but would you agree with me that that would be uh, at least a sign that it's, this prophecy is not as clear as what one may think. Um, not necessarily when it becomes clear to the just simplicity of to, to me the whole story it, the, the story from beginning to end in fact i, I have i have an atheist friend or excuse me, a theist friend who's not a christian you know asked me this we're going from the story from creator to adam and eve to deception to wanting to be god to eating off the true tree of knowledge to sin being cast in the earth to, to other people and wanting to be their own god and being their own authority and so, like to me, that that story sounds very clear when you when you get into the hairs of it, uh, with some of the stories like you just mentioned. There's, there certainly could be some disagreements, but to me, the the, the clear, obvious parts are like, for instance, uh, the the Catholic that was on earlier, which it was nice talking with him. I was actually really, to be honest with you, it hurt my heart when I heard him say, "You ask him if you should call him a Christian or a Catholic," and when he said, "Call me a Catholic," I, it kind of broke my heart a little bit because while I would ve I vehemently disagree with a lot of the Roman Catholic Church teachings. Um, I just wanted to hear him say that he believed Jesus Christ died on the cross and therefore he's a Christian and that's who we, that, so, so, so for instance, I, yeah, I can Aaron, only claim. Aaron, before we get off of prophecies, like can, um, like you asked me earlier if I could acknowledge what you've said. And so I, I, I replayed, I, I told you what, what you said and I summarized it to show evidence that you were, I was listening to you. Can you do the same for me with the prophecies? What was my point with the prophecies? Why did I talk about what I did? It sounded like what you were saying was there was a, and by the way, that was a respectful way of, of telling, of uh, kind of being a jerk to me, but you did good. You did good. <laughs> Passive aggressive, uh, so right? What was, was, so based on, I was, I was using prophecies as to a reason why I believe in God, and you were suggesting that. There were even Christians that still had arguments about the prophecy in itself. And so I, and you were wondering what, what would you say as maybe even a believer or an outsider when you're reviewing it at that, at that point. And I can understand that. And um, I think it's a decent point. I, I think I made a long sentence of saying that I don't think that we have to agree on everything. I think the fact that you can see sol solidarity within a main core of prophecies is enough for me as it is, if, so, if that makes sense. Uh, yeah, um, and I went a little further than that, and I even mentioned, you know, how do the Jews view these prophecies? Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. I'm sorry, and, you know. And, and uh, but here's the thing. I don't think you believe what you believe because of the prophecies. I think you believe what you believe based on the very first part of our conversation. But that being said, if we're looking at prophecies and you're looking at, let's say, Isaiah um, 53 or Daniel 9, that most people say Daniel 9 is the best one. So if we were to take the very best prophecy that most Christians would say is, hey, this is amazing, and we now pick it apart and analyze it, critique it, and you ask yourself, how does the Jew view this prophecy? Um, how does the atheist who the atheistic historian who knows, who spent their whole life studying this stuff, view this prophecy? And then how do various Christians view it? And I tell you, they all have different answers, which tells me that number one, the prophecy is not clear. And number two, that there is an explanation for these prophecies out there that do not involve a supernatural explanation. So then we are left with the what's more likely question, that there is a supernatural prophecy for 100 years prior, or that the second half of the book of Daniel was written in 160 BC instead of 580 BC that most apologists say. And I don't want to get into the minutia of it. I just bring that up to make a point. Okay, well, I understand what you're saying, but I mean, it would also be like, to me, it would be like putting a woman 
in front of three different guys and asking them what they thought about it, right? You, you're going to get three very different yes. opinions, right? Yes. So, of course, you know, C.S. Lewis writes, you know, the one thing we cannot screw up here, either Jesus Christ was a maniac, ego, egotistical idiot, or he was the son of God. He was not a man of God as a prophet claiming to be the son of God there to save sinners, casting out spirits and rising from the dead. There's no way he could do that in God's name without being who he said he was. If he wasn't who he said he was, then he's essentially equivalent to to the devil. Yeah, right? for, I mean, he's, <laughs> yeah uh, and you know what? I love C.S. Lewis for saying that. And, and for, for those of you who are not familiar, what Aaron's talking about is the trilemma argument where Jesus is, is either a liar or a lunatic or a Lord. But Aaron, I'm going to ask you this question. Sure. Maybe there's a fourth option. All right. I'll be interested to hear. What if Jesus never even made the claim to begin with that he was God? Well, so what you're uh, you're suggesting that possibly all the different gospels that were written in different areas of the Middle Eastern world at the time all made up the same lie at the same time, or maybe the Roman Catholic Church manipulated it. What if it's a screenplay, a passion narrative? What if some of it's actually historical, but maybe some of it isn't? What if it was a, a screenplay based on a real character, but was legendized later on? decades after well do you if you don't mind me asking are you possibly because a lot of times when i talk to atheists they'll they'll try to use the uh, greek mythology uh comparison they'll say well how do you know zeus isn't god how do you know you know well, are you suggesting possibly this guy's kind of in a sense of fictional figure no i'm not suggesting that i, I like i said it could be a real guy that was legendized later what if there is a guy coming out of the Essene movement? And the Essene movement, for those who don't know, is, is basically an apocalyptic movement, that the end is drawing nigh. And, and they were very aesthetic as well, uh, you know, giving to the poor. What if the, it was based on a guy from the Essene movement that walked around Jerusalem and people noticed this guy, and he was very charismatic, and people loved him? But then he started causing problems within the government and the commotions and so forth. What exactly happened, I don't know. But what if that narrative that we read as historical events, and we just take it as historical, what if that's not true? So when C.S. Lewis says he's either a liar, lunatic, or lord, why don't we add the word legend to that? So... And then, then we have to ask ourselves the what's more likely question. What is more likely that this person named Jesus actually did rise from the dead or that a book just says he did? Okay, so, I mean, when I think about somebody, and by the way, that's a good point. That's well-spoken. And like I said, I really am enjoying speaking with you. Um, the... Uh, the idea of somebody rising from the dead to me sounds no more crazy than the fact that we exist in the first place. So the idea of somebody rising from the dead to me is not problematic. It doesn't sound crazy. It doesn't bother me at all. So it doesn't bother somebody rising from the dead doesn't doesn't strike me as, as something very bothersome when I think of the miracles of life in the first place. Okay, Don't, Aaron, Aaron, I'm gonna have to call you out on this one. Um, go ahead. Um, I have a neighbor just west of me. He was dead for like 37 days in the month of September <laughs> and partially October. And, um, and he rose from the dead. Do you believe me? Uh, if I have reason to believe it, I would. I, I don't believe you. <clears throat> you shouldn't believe me, Aaron. You should not believe that. We should question it. We should sure well, a, a, an empty tomb, no bones, and four different people writing in the gospel being prophesied in the past. That would be a lot different than just a person I've never met making a claim about his neighbor that I don't know anything about. I mean, that, that you, I think you could understand the difference there. Yeah, I do understand it, but again, um, and the, and I'm trying to say this in a way that will resonate, and I know it never does. So, but I'm going to try anyhow. 
All right. No, I might. You might convert me to atheism right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, there might not have even been a tomb. Well, like, so if we get back to C.S. Lewis, we'll say we'll put it this way too. Um, I don't believe in Christ, or excuse me, I believe in Christ as I believe in the risen Son, not because I see it, but because of it, I can see everything else. And through the lens of thoughts being captive to Christ, I've learned to love, I've learned to understand, and I've learned to make sense of origin, meaning, morality, and destiny. And I've been able to make sense of why I love, why I care, why it makes sense for people to treat people a certain way. And it's just, I'm, I don't know if you've read Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis. It's just a simple way of the way he talks where he went from atheism to theism to Christian theism. Um, and I'm, I don't worship C.S. Lewis by any means, but I have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Sometimes I go to bed and I don't pray. Sometimes I just go lay down and I throw on something stupid on my YouTube Maybe even the Howard Stern show. It might be a Trump insult compilation, just because I've been laughing at those recently. World and, videos uh, from my channel, of course. Your favorite content. Yeah, yeah. I just watch nothing but replays of Johnny saying mean things to me, and uh, so. Uh, but my point is, is that, and then there's sometimes I lay down and I know, I feel there's an intuitive pull on my, in what I would say, my heart, my spirit that says, Aaron, I need to talk to you. God says, I want to talk to you. I lay down and I, and you know, sometimes I try to fight it. I'm like, you know what? I'm not really in the mood to pray. I'm going to go to bed and I'll lay down there and I'll be like, you know, and it just, it's hit me. It's hit me, it's hit me in my head. And, and I'll say, okay, Lord. So then I, so then you follow, not that I, you know, have, you don't have to follow the Lord's prayer, but you know, you, you th give thanks. You know, thanks for my niece. Thanks for my nephew. Thanks for my brother. Thanks for my job. Thanks for my apartment. Thanks for my car. Thanks for friends like Johnny and you to even talk to me where I can share the love that I get to experience with him daily. Thanks for the fact that my parents, know you that my cousins and, and my aunts and my grandparents that i still have um, you know my my nep uh, nieces and nephews that are still you know they're being taught the bible right off and just thank you lord for that thank you for my food and i love you and i just ask for your blessings and no matter what if i'm under a bridge and i can't eat and i'm dying i still will love you because i i know you're there i, I just know he exists i mean it's it's it's, it's like um you know, like Socrates said, or maybe it was Aristotle, it says, I think, therefore, I know. What is it? I... Hey, Aaron. Um, right. I, I want to make an observation that uh, I want to share with you that I've experienced firsthand for the last year when I'm talking to theists, that when the conversation that we've had, what ends up happening, and I, and you'll, I think you'll agree with me when, you, when I say this, we started from a personal experience years ago when you first became a believer. Then we started talking about some other things, uh, about worldviews and incoherencies. And then we moved to prophecies. And then we moved to evidence from the Bible. Uh, and C.S. Lewis talking about he was either liar, lunatic, or Lord. And now we're moving back to personal experience. And what I'm just saying this as an observation that what's happening now is you believe because you believe. And now these reasons are popping up. And I'm playing whack-a-mole with you. And it's like every time I whack a reason down, you pop up a new one. And, <clears throat> and I'm going to say this as gently as I can, but a bunch of bad reasons doesn't make one good one. <laughs> Are you waiting for me to respond? No, uh, not not necessarily. And I do have to go soon. And I'm uh, I'll gladly give you the last yeah. word. But but this I, I just want you to, to let you know that this is where I'm coming from. That when I hear what I hear, and not just from you, but from people in other de belief systems, this is what ends up happening. And so, if we are truth seekers, if we really want to try to get as close as we can to this thing called truth. I think it, the first step is to see this within ourselves, what we're doing. And so that's why I'm saying what I'm saying to you. Okay. Um, my last word, and then we'll let you guys go. Sure. Um, I don't think it's at all um, a thwart or obstacle against truth to have multiple reasons why you believe. You mentioned we go to prophecy, we go to belief, we go to evidence, we go to... But of course, as a presuppositionalist, we haven't really talked much about it at all. But of course, I believe 
even the idea of questioning this whole thing, this whole subject means that there's something weighing on us to even have that thought in the first place because we can't make sense of that thought without something, right? Uh, you can't make sense of that. a brick or how about nothing, right? So nothing became somehow a brick and a brick somehow is thinking about if there's a God or not. So that in itself should be very frightening. And I think that's why atheists like yourself and Johnny like talking about this because I, I have to imagine you feel pretty unfulfilled with we're trying to say that you can't believe in anything immaterial outside of yourself that's intelligent when you have thoughts that are immaterial and intelligent and you can't explain where they came from. I mean, that's that's got to be a haunting task. C.S. Lewis talks about it. What could be more haunting than a mortal person haunted at once by the same one that haunts him uh, when, he, when, he, when he thinks and challenges him? And so I I don't think that it's inappropriate or... or um, uh, amateurish or sophomoric of me to, to try to reference uh, different reasons why I believe in God. So when I when I think about origin, meaning, moral destiny, when I think about the historicity of Jesus Christ, when I think about the authenticity of the Bible, when I think about my personal relationship with him, when I think about the fulfilled prophecies, and then I know when I go to bed at night, and when I tell people, you know, I got to tell you, and I, I'll make this 30 seconds, I'll let you guys go. I can't tell you how many people that I've just shared what I've shared with you that have said, wow, I feel, I, I feel like God led me to talk to you. Not, not necessarily they become a Christian by talking to me, but they feel some good in it. They, they feel like they're being talked to by somebody that's not appreciating the material world, right? Now, I'm not a, I, don't, I don't give a shit how much money you got. I don't care what kind of car you drive. I don't care what job you work. I love you as an image bearer of God. And it's, it's been fulfilling to me and amazing at the same time to see people really appreciate that and say, you know, I need more people like that in my life. Just, just, just to love them for who they are, and so uh, I'll let you go on saying that I don't find it uh, awkward at all to have multiple reasons for believing in God. But I know a, I have a relationship with him. B, I can't explain anything without him. And C, everything that I have, that uh, to me material-wise, that I have to put together, two plus two plus two plus two, all makes sense and adds up. Like you said, it could could it possibly be a lie? Well, then the other four things would have to would have to be incoherent either uh, or as well. So. That's where I'm at. And Doug, you've been such a, a great guy. I hope uh, Johnny will uh, make sure we can exchange info. I'd love to see what you do, the work you do on James White and Jeff Berman. And I'd love to stay, uh, you know, part of your life. Yeah, whatever you guys do, don't go to the Pine Creek YouTube channel. Don't go there. <laughs> and don't subscribe or you're, yeah. Because you won't like work. me anymore because I come down pretty hard on James White on one video. So.